after I preach. Is that okay? So our kids are going to children's church. Her gift of singing should not have laid dormant that long. Amen. And maybe I'll agree with that. We're going this morning to the book of Proverbs, chapter 18. How many of y'all are going to help me this morning? Amen. Proverbs, chapter 18. And then we're going to Revelation, chapter 21. like I normally preach, but I want you to hear me. And what I feel like the Lord has laid on my heart for this hour. And so I want to go from Proverbs 18 and read one verse. And then Revelation chapter 21 and read a couple verses there. This chapter or this verse in Proverbs should get out, give all the women an opportunity to say amen. All right. Verse 22. Whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor of the Lord. Did I get an amen? Amen. Whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing amen. and obtains favor of the Lord. Revelation 21. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. He'll dwell with them, and they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall be, there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. I want to preach on the Lamb's bride this morning. Is that okay? Amen. The Lamb's bride. Tuesday night, I was sitting at the house. Now, all week this week, I may have slept four or five hours. I have every single night of this week. I've laid down to go to sleep, fell off to sleep, and had the Lord to wake me up. I've stayed up for hours upon hours throughout the night. And the Lord dealing with me about where we should be as a church. Amen. And on Tuesday night, I, I, I was awakened by a dream. I, I'm not going to tell you the dream, but I, I was awakened by a dream that, you ever have those dreams where your heart beats fast? Mm -hmm. You feel like you can't get out of the dream? Amen. But you want to. Uh -huh. and, uh, I was awakened by and found myself sitting up in the bed and I was hollering to the top of my voice. I don't know if I was preaching, but that preaching spirit was on me. And it was almost like a frantic, uh, like somebody needed to hear what I had to say. I came out of that and I heard the Lord say to me, I want you to get the bride ready. Yes, sir. Amen. 
hear me if you don't hear me say nothing else. I want you to get the bride ready. I begin to think that if I was going to be summoned to get the bride ready, I, I needed to understand what takes place in a wedding. Not a western wedding like we have, but what would Jesus be speaking about when he spoke of weddings? Or what would he allow John the Revelator, why would he talk about in Revelation 21, I saw the bride adorned for her husband. Coming from a Jewish background, what would Jesus' mindset be of getting the bride ready? In order for me to get a bride ready or to get the church ready for the coming of the Lord, I had to understand about a Jewish wedding. I, I'm going to take my time this morning. So I started thinking about, I wonder what the heart of the bridegroom would be. And I think Kimley sung it so good, that last song she sung this morning, the heart of the bridegroom would be that he thinks we're worth saving. Amen. I wish I had some help in there. He chose us, hallelujah. He, uh, he, he saw us where we were at. In fact, one of the Old Testament scriptures in a prophetic utterance, the Bible said, I passed by thee and I saw thee polluted in thine own blood. And I said unto thee, while thou wast polluted in thy blood, I said unto thee, live. Yea, I say unto thee, live. And aren't you glad this morning that our bridegroom, uh, he could have chose anybody, but uh, he got to the opportunity to choose his own bride. And aren't you glad this morning that he chose you? Yeah. Hallelujah. He chose you understanding that what you were when he chose you was not what you were going to be once he dialed you up and fixed you up and adorned you as a bride. He understood that the last glory of the house would be greater than the first. He understood that if he got, if he took time with you and, and, and made you to be something great, that when the process was over, you would be a bride that was ready and willing for the bridegroom to come again. I don't know about you this morning, but this world has nothing to offer me any longer, and I am glad to say that I am part of the bride, and the older I get is the more willing I am getting to allow the groom to come and get me. I am ready more today for the coming of the Lord than I was 20 years ago or 30 years ago. In fact, I'll say it like Revelation said, and the bride and the spirit say, come Lord Jesus and come quickly. I don't know if you're looking for the coming of the Lord and if you're not, it might be because you're not ready, but I'm saying from this pulpit that I would love to see the coming of the Lord happen quickly. Glory to God. What would be the heart of the bridegroom? Let me slow down because I didn't want to preach preach this morning. What would be the beauty of the bride? What is it that attracted God to you in the first place? What's the covenant of a marriage that they have between one another? You should, uh, or you would be hard pressed to find a more joyous occasion in the land of Israel than a marriage supper or a marriage or a wedding that was going to take place. In fact, if you read Bible history, the Hebrew word for wedding is the word simcha, which means a joyous occasion. You know what that means? It means that when the Lord found you and he chose you as a bride, he did it with joy. May I preach on just a minute? Hebrews 12 says let us lay aside every weight and sin which so easily besets us and let us run with patience the race that set before us looking unto Jesus the author and the finisher of our faith who for the joy that was before him he endured the cross despising the shame and is now set down 
me slow down because I, I want to hit the points. They, they called it Simca because it was a joyous occasion. It was joyous because it was a time where two people, a man and a woman, did you hear me? Amen. I said a man and a woman, would, tie, would join in a mutual commitment between the two and it would be sealed by the approval of God. So you don't need approval of men. You don't need men looking down on you and saying you're not worthy to be in the bride. I'm telling you, whosoever the Son set free is free indeed. You don't have to worry about somebody else's judgment or somebody else's jealousy concerning where you are and your position in the Lord. If the Lord has chosen you, you ain't got to worry about nobody else. You can dance around them. You can shout all over their pocketbook. You ain't got to worry about what somebody thinks of you. You don't have to be concerned with somebody thinking you're anointed or not anointed. If you're in the bride of Christ, you are here. Hallelujah. Because he chose you. He called. Many are called. But hallelujah, few are chosen. I heard the call. And when I approached the caller, he saw my beauty. And he looked at that beauty and said, I'm going to make a bride out of that. Are you hearing me this morning? I came to him broken, but he turned it into blessing. I came to him damaged, but he turned it into something great. I came to him swallowing in my sin, but he picked me up. He turned me around. I feel like preaching old time You like it or not, or whether the world likes it or not, I'm here because he chose me. He chose me. Genesis 2.18 said that the Lord God said, It is not good for a man to be alone. I'll say amen to that. It's not good for a man to be alone. I'll make a helpmate suitable for him. That means that the bride is chosen and crafted to be the perfect selection for the heart of that man. In the Jewish wedding, let me just explain a couple of things real quick. In the Jewish wedding, there's three different parts of that wedding. Uh, there is the Shinnecom, which is the mutual commitment to each other. And then there is the Edison, which is the engagement. And then in the Hebrew, there is the mission, which is the marriage. Uh, the first one refers to the preliminary arrangements prior to the legal betrothal. The legal contract specified the groom's responsibility in caring for the bride. You ought to be thankful this morning that our groom in heaven has given us a legal contract. I am his bride because he says I am his bride. I have the promises of the groom because he wrote them in a book. I have the promises and the blessing of being attached to the bridegroom because everything in this book is pertaining to me. I wish somebody would help me right now. If you don't think you've got nothing to shout about, you ought to pick up this old blessed black book. It's the marriage contract that God's give us. And you ought to pick up the pages and read how blessed you are, how highly favored you are, how adored you are. Can I tell you the master, the groom came with gifts. He came with talent. Marriages 
were looked upon as a, 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 a between two people. They would just get together for reasons of survival. You can read about that. In the old Jewish customs, they would literally get together because of reasons of survival. I want to tell you something this morning. You know what I'm doing in church? I'm surviving. You know why I'm staying married to him? Because I want to survive. You ain't helping me. The world's in a mess, but I want to survive. Hallelujah. And I can't survive without him. Did you hear what I'm saying? If you think you've got it all together and you don't need a man, hallelujah, if you don't need the groom helping you out, I'm telling you as a bride, the bride can do nothing within herself. You can't produce without a groom. You can't be protected without a groom. You can't survive without a groom. You ought to be thankful for the groom. Hallelujah. Because you are what you are only by the grace of the groom. I wish I had some help in here. He's my supplier. He's my healer. He's my savior. He's my baptizer in the Holy Ghost. I'm his bride and I'm covered by his protection. Good preaching, Pastor. That legal contract specified the groom's responsibility in caring for the bride. Here's what I found out in ancient Jewish times. The marriage was arranged by the father of the groom. While we were yet sinners. The wedding was arranged Amen. by the Father. Amen. I mean, God saw the world in corruption. In the day, even by the days of Noah, the Bible said, and men did that which was evil in their own eyes. Are you hearing me? I mean, constantly they were evil in their thinking, evil in their actions, evil in everything that they were going through and living out. And God looked at that and said, out of that mess, I'm going to raise up a bride. I'm going to, out of that dirty, rotten stuff, I'm going to raise up a bride that's dressed in white garments without a spot and without a wrinkle or without a blemish. You ought to shout right now. Because you are not what you used to be. But may I say to you in prophetic utterance, you are not what you are going to be. He's dressing you up, getting you ready for the ultimate wedding feast. And even though it was arranged by the Father, listen to me, even though a marriage in Jewish days was arranged by the Father, the groom, the consent of the bride was important. Let me go somewhere. Genesis chapter 24. Abraham sends his eldest servant. Go seek me out a bride for my son Isaac. Isaac's in the field working. He doesn't know that Abraham has sent to get a bride. Come here, Brother Terry. Help me right quick, will you? Come on right up on stage. Come here, Brother Tony. Now stand right there, Isaac. You good? Uh, did you know if you find a wife, you can find a good thing, right? Amen. So you're standing there. You, 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 you need to be married. I, I, I'm Abraham. You, you're Isaac. I, you need to be married. And so I, I'm going to send my eldest servant. Everybody say Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. I'm going to send you out to find the bride. I've done chosen. I wish somebody helped me right now. I've done chosen. I, I, I'm going to take her out of the world. I'm going to do something nobody else would ever do. But you've got to go to the world and find her. And the Bible said he's commissioned by the father Abraham to go and find the bride. On his travel, he began, he, he, before he ever leaves, he asked the father Abraham. He says, Abraham, uh, perseverance that uh, just uh, perhaps she's not willing to come. Uh, first of all, what do I do? He said, give her the invitation. And if she rejects the invitation, then don't bother her any longer. 
He said, well, how will I know which woman in that country down there is chosen to be the bride? He said, you're going to have ten camels following you. Nine of them are going to be loaded with gifts. One of them is going to be empty to carry the bride back. He said, when you get to the well where you're going, the first woman that comes out and offers to water your camel and to work for it, uh, if you see what I'm seeing, he said the first woman willing to work for it, not to be slothful and lazy, not to know that she's a bride, but not thankful to be a bride. That woman is the one I've chosen. So the elder servant goes down to Mesopotamia. The Bible said, uh, loaded nine camels and the tenth one empty. She gets down, but he gets down to the well, and here comes Rebecca. Rebecca comes out, ain't it weird? A Rebecca comes out to the well, and when she gets to the well, yes, sir, somebody that didn't deserve to be in Abraham's family, wasn't a part of the faith, didn't deserve to be married to Isaac. I feel the Holy Ghost on me. Hallelujah. But she was chosen. She was betrothed. Here she comes out. The older servant is standing there by the way. She comes out and says, Oh, you got 10 camels. It's 26 steps down into that well and 26 steps back. I don't know if you know about camels, but they got three stomachs. Every stomach holds eight gallons of water. Eight times three is 24 gallons. Ten camels is 240 gallons. I'm going to go down into that well. I'm willing to work for this thing. You want me to go back and be a bride? I've been waiting on somebody to love me enough to pull me up out of what I've been in and marry me. I wish I had some help. They went down into that well. 26 steps down and 26 steps back up. She watered all the camels and watered the man of God. Help me right now. He told her, you got to come with me to the land of Abraham. You're going to meet his son Isaac. She said, let me go back and tell my daddy goodbye. I'm never going to be here again. And by the way, what do I get? Separately. I don't know if you know where I'm going, but according to Matthew chapter. 
chapter 3, I heard the Bible say that John the Baptist was on the Jordan River. He was standing on the shore preaching the gospel saying, who has pleased you or warned you to flee from the wrath to come? I bet I indeed baptized under repentance, but there's one coming after me whose shoes I'm not even worthy to reach down and loosen it. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire and the fire of the Lord is in his hand. About that time, here comes Jesus, the first cousin or the second cousin of John the Baptist across that Jordan hillside walked down into that water and said, I need to be baptized. Why? Because he was going to be the groom and to fulfill a Jewish wedding, he had to be a totally immersed in water. Help me right now. Now you know why we have water baptism. Because what Jesus done in Matthew 3, when I enter into water baptism, I am totally telling the world I'm no longer married to the world. I've been divorced to the world. And now I'm married to Christ. I'm totally immersed in everything. Everything he's got to offer me. Mark 16, 16. He that believeth and baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. So when I enter that marriage covenant, I've got to follow through with what Jesus did. Y'all got five minutes and I'm done. After immersion, the groom and the bride would enter what they bought, what, what, what they called the tent of marriage. It was a canopy. It is here that the groom would give gifts to the bride. Hallelujah. He would place a ring on her finger. He would give her wine to drink. He would give her gifts under the canopy of marriage. See, you were saved in the world. But you were brought into the canopy. You're in the tent of tabernacles. This is the tent of praise. This is where you get your ring. Well, I could have some fun right here. This is where you get your ring. This is where the Lord slides that on your finger as a covenant of love. This is where he gives you gifts that don't belong to you. They are gifts of the Holy Ghost, but he wants you to have them. So he gives you gifts. This is where, help me right now, this is where he gives you wine to drink. And we know that the wine is the joyous blood sacrifice of the Lord. He puts the blood in you and he gives you garments and he gives you gifts. During this period, the groom was to prepare, listen to this, a place for the bride. It is under the canopy of marriage that the groom leaves her. He leaves. He leaves. She will no longer see him for a year's time. He leaves. It is his responsibility in this time to prepare a place for the bride. You can quote John 14 right there if you want to. Let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Behold, I go to prepare a place for you. That where I am there, you may be also. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am there, you may be also. Y'all want me to quote the rest of the chapter? Listen to what I'm telling you. He's gone. He's fulfilling his part of the marriage vows. It is his responsibility in this period of time to prepare a place for the bride, but it is the bride's focus on to, to her responsibility to focus on her personal appearance, her wedding garments and the lamps burning for when he comes again. 
You don't think that God's got anything to do with your dress code? You better talk to a bride. Right. I've, I've done weddings for 34 years. I've never, ever, ever seen a half put together bride. The groom might come in. I, I've done some weddings where the groom had the all night party and come in, his hair wasn't all together right. He had smell of alcohol on his breath. Because I've not always done weddings for church folks. I've seen the groom's shirt wrinkle. Them have to put the jacket on to cover the wrinkles. But I've never seen a bride halfway put together. I'm going to tell you something. They're even, they even got a thing called the bride party. You know what that means? It means other women get around her and they'll fix her hair, and they'll put the makeup on her, and they make sure she's looking right, and when she walks down the aisle, they'll grab the garment of her dress and lay it out so that when she walks down, the, the tail of that garment, is that what it's called? The tail of that wedding dress will flow just right. I've even seen them interrupt a wedding by getting to the, to the front of the church, and somebody would hand off their flowers. They dress that bride up to have a bouquet. They get they, they hand off the flowers to get around and fix the dress of the, of the bride. But I have never seen a groomsman leave. I've never seen that best man come over in the middle of that and try to straighten the, the, the groom. You know why? If you turn that spiritually, there is nothing about Jesus that needs to be straightened up. There's nothing about him that's not correct. There's nothing about him that's not perfect. It's us that are the bride that needs people around us to teach us how to walk right, how to talk right, how to dress right. We're preparing to be his bride. And in that preparation, I, I've got to, as the bride, I've got to make sure my garments are right. I don't want the Lord coming back thinking he's married to a hooker. So my dress needs to be right. I don't want to show other men what only my groom ought to be seeing. I wish I had some help here. I, I, I don't want I don't want to be showing off trying to show off my physique when the Lord comes it got real quiet on me because I have found out that when you talk about the stories that Jesus talks when he deals with parables there is a tie scripture to the parable of wedding garments along with trim lamps. Let me prove that. Matthew chapter 25. Behold, there was ten virgins. Five had oil and five did not. They were waiting for the call of the bridegroom. Go you out to meet the groom. Y'all remember the story? All ten of them had lamps. Five of them had no oil in their lamps. But they all jumped up because they'd been slumbering and sleeping. They got their wedding garments on and dressed up. It. But their lamps had gone out, five of them. They were not fools because the Bible said the fool has said in his heart there is no God. A fool is not looking for the coming of the Lord. No, sir. He's not looking for the coming of the groom. No, sir. They had just started living foolishly. The Bible said they called them foolish virgins. They were still pure. Come on, somebody. But they were living foolish as if the Lord was never going to come. But how many of y'all know that when he comes, it's it's not good enough to be dressed right if your lamps have went out. In other words, the dressing right is an outward, outward appearance of responsibility. I want the Lord to come and I want him to find me dressed right on the outside. But the lamp has nothing to do with the outside. The lamp has to do with the inside. Come on, somebody. That when the groom comes, he needs to find the outside and the inside of you ready for the wedding. Ready for the wedding. I, I, I 
tell you something I wrote down in my notes. And, and I, I, I found it kind of strange that the bride is never told when the groom is coming. All she knows is sometime after that year of him preparing a place and her preparing herself. Right. Yes, come on. Sometime he's coming. Sometime after that. And then, you know who makes the decision when he comes? His dad. His father looks over his son and says, the bride's there already. So go get your bride, son. He ain't sending nobody to get us but himself. Gabriel may sound the trumpet if you want to believe it that way. Come on, somebody. I heard the Bible say the Lord, the, the trumpet of the Lord's going to sound. I don't know. You can believe what you want to, but the trumpet of the Lord's going to sound. But what, whoever blows that trumpet, he ain't sending an angel to get us. He's not sending some angelic being a four-footed beast or some four-faced being. No, sir. When the Lord comes to get his bride, he's going to walk down that aisle. Come on, somebody. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, and the trumpet of God shall sound. Hallelujah. The dead in Christ will rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be called up together with them in the air, and so shall we ever, hallelujah, be with the Lord. She don't know when he's coming. For no man knoweth the hour of the day when the Son of Man comes. The times of the end of time is in the hands of the Father. But because she doesn't know when he's coming, the bride, if she's wise, keeps her oil lamps ready at all times, yes, trimmed and burdened at all times. I preached two of the steps. And let me allude to the third one quickly and I close. The third final step in the wedding is known as Nisa. Here's what it means. That Hebrew word means to take up or to lift up. You want to talk about the word rapture? You can use that word. It don't scare me. Because it just means the catching, the taking away. The final thing that groom does is he decides the bride has had enough living where she's living. <laughs> and I'm coming to get her. And I'm going to take her out. This world is not my home. I'm only passing through. My treasures are a duck. Somewhere beyond the blue. My friends and loved ones wait. Who trod this way before. And I cannot feel at home. In this world anymore, oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, dear Lord, what would I do? The angels wait for me. Heaven's open door, and I can't not feel at home in this world. Once again, at the catching, listen to this, this is powerful, at the taking out or the lifting up of the bride, he picks her up as if to say, I'm taking you out of what you've been in. And once again, the groom and the bride enter the marriage tent 
and recite a blessing and finalize their vows. Put your words up here. I'm glad you asked. Because according to Revelation, there is a temple built in heaven. When he comes to take us out, right now we're in a canopy, a tent of the wedding. But when he takes us out, we're going to enter in that temple over there. And our marriage and our wedding will be finalized when we receive the full blessing of what he promised us. The musicians can come on. I know I preach kind of mediocre today, but the reality is we need to get ready. If the signs of the time are correct, and they are. You can guarantee that the Lord is soon to come. He's soon to come. And how many of y'all know he's coming after somebody that's fit to be married to the groom? Let's stand all over this place. Thank you. 
next Sunday. Okay, so make sure you bring them in those toboggans, gloves, and nobody like this. Just bring them. Okay, let's have a good home for this next Sunday. I love you. Listen, I need your attendance here tonight. As you know, when we well, we got 70 something people here today, today uh, because of the snow, hopefully some of our people will be back tonight. But we need your attendance tonight. We'll start at 6 o'clock. We'll see everybody then. Hug on each other.